Simonon's Makele, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. grateful, Jules, to whatever ministerial deity was responsible, that you were never transferred to the Rue des Saucets. Why exactly, Georges? Because I've never really appreciated the way security chaps work. <laughs> oh, that's an understatement, if ever there was one. You know, I once said that security's methods reminded me of a lot of crabs crawling and scratching about in the basket. I hope you didn't say it to one of them. Yes, but he'd left the Rue des Saucets by then. Like so many, he had to leave or face being kicked out. Benoit was his name. Now, that was the one time I found myself involved in security and hence in politics. The missing report business, was that it? It was. I arrived home one evening after dinner with my chief and Lucas Jean-Vier, one of our informal get-togethers, and I was feeling nice and mellow. I asked Louise about phone calls, more or less as a formality. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret, Michael Goff as Georges Simonon, and Peter Pratt as Auguste Poin in Maigret and the Minister. I'm afraid there was one. Oh, you sound serious. You've time for a cup of coffee. Take your coat off for a minute. It's only half past ten, and I said I didn't expect you back until eleven. Well, I'm still waiting to hear who it was ringing. A minister. A priest? <laughs> no. No, of course not. Poin, I think he said. The minister of public works. That's right. Auguste Poin. He phoned here himself. He wanted to speak to you personally. He asked if I was alone or not, and he said his call was to be kept secret. Was it indeed? Did he say where he was phoning from? Yes, a public call box. Honestly, Jules, I could hardly believe my ears. A minister of the Republic creeping out and making a phone call from some scruffy box on the corner of a street. Well, it can happen. Where does he want to see me? Well, not at the ministry, but at his private apartment at uh, 27 Boulevard Pasteur. Do you think it's a hoax? Well, it's a bit out of the ordinary, but it's no hoax. You'll have some coffee no, before... No, I'll have a glass of slow gin and then I'll be on my way. The sooner this is over, the better. Can I offer you a cigar, Megri? Well, I'd prefer my pipe, Your Excellency, if I may. Try some of this tobacco. Oh, thank you. Look, Megri, between men like us, there's no point in the usual formalities. I'm in terrible trouble. Nobody knows it yet, neither the President nor my wife come to that. I've come to you first. I know what I'm doing is irregular, and you're under no obligation to help me. Will you have a drink? Oh, well, uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Good. I think that the use of my title is not necessary at the moment. Very well, Monsieur. These are some homemade spirits. My father distills some every autumn. This bottle must be 20 years old. Will you try it? I shall be delighted. Do you read the newspapers, Megri? Oh, when the world of crime allows me the time to do so. Mm. Your health? Ah, thank you. And yours? Mm -hmm. mm. This was in the Globe a few weeks ago. I've marked the paragraph. Ah. Will someone one day decide, under pressure of public opinion, to reveal the contents of the Kalam report? When revealed, it's likely to bring the government down, some people think. So when will it be published? Hmm. The Kalam report. On what, monsieur? A report written by a distinguished engineer, Julien Kalam, who died a couple of years ago, on the building of the Clairfont Sanatorium. The Clairfont Sanatorium for Abandoned Children. The same. The place that last winter saw one of our most terrible disasters. The whole wing of the place came down, do you remember? Yes, 100 or more children died in the... 128. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, it was built high up in the Haute Savoie, and there was some disagreement as to whether it was in the right place. Correct. And how it should be built, the design and materials. Kalam was asked to consider the whole question, study the project and the site as an impartial expert which he did. The report was the result 
and it was never published. Now, what happened at Carthorne? The snow melted early, very early. A subterranean river, it wasn't marked on the maps, but people knew of it, swelled and undermined the foundations of that wing of the building. They built over an underground stream. Well, who was the builder, monsieur? Nico and Sauvegrain. Arthur Nicou, in fact. Ah, oh, yes, I have heard of him. It's a very large firm, I believe. Oh, very. And Monsieur Arthur Nicou is a very powerful man. Now, I assume that the report made by Julien Calam was against building the sanatorium where it was built. Most emphatically. Mm. And against many of the constructional ideas being mooted at the time, but the report was ignored. I was not in office then, so I have no knowledge of the whys and wherefores of this. And Arthur Nicou put his building up. The report is therefore, Your Excellency, like a stick of dynamite with a slow fuse. The report is... I'll come to that shortly. Soon after that short but portentous piece appeared in the Globe, I was asked by the President to mount a search for the Kalam report within my ministry. Briefly, it wasn't where it should be, in the archives of the Chamber of Deputies. Nor was it within the civil engineering branch, and although my ministry was turned inside out, it wasn't there either. Uh, another glass? Oh, well, thank you. The taste is very delicate. Mm. Yesterday morning, a man called Peekmal turned up. He looked like an anarchist with a brown paper parcel under his arm containing a bomb. Actually, he was a supervisor at the School of Civil Engineering, and the parcel contained a carbon copy of the Kalam report. Where did this happen? Where? Uh, at the ministry in my room. And were you alone, monsieur? My secretary, Mademoiselle Blanche, showed him in and then left the room. My parliamentary private secretary was in an outer room where there were various people waiting to see me. Peekmel asked me to open the parcel, or almost ordered me to. I did, and saw what it was. He said he wanted a receipt, so I wrote one out for him. Where did he say he'd found the report? In the attics of the School of Engineering. But hadn't they been searched previously when you were looking? Yes, of course they had. Perhaps he'd had it under his bed for years. Is it authentic, would you say? It was an unsigned carbon with Kalam's name and qualifications on the last page with a date. Later that day, I read it through. I'm sure it's a copy of the original report, and it would have caused an explosion if it had been published after the disaster. Julien Calam prophesied the disaster. Almost to the fine print. You kept the report with you? I brought it back here to this apartment that night. I placed it in the desk over there and locked it. I had to speak to the president, and I couldn't do so last night. He was away, and quite frankly, I don't trust telephone calls, as no doubt your wife has surmised. So I waited until this afternoon when I could speak to him in private. I told him of the carbon copy and he asked me to bring it personally to his study. I came back here to collect it. And it was no longer in your desk? It was no longer in my desk. And, and the lock? Had it been tampered with? I don't think so. See for yourself. Oh. I'm very bad with this sort of thing, but I'd say that this lock could be opened with a decent hairpin. Now, beside the president and... What's his name? Big one. Well, mm. They alone knew I had the report. Do you understand me, Gray? I find myself quite alone. I dare not open my mouth. Who would believe my story? Who would believe that I held the report in my hands? Had it with me for some 24 hours and then had it stolen from my apartment. And, and there's this. At least three times in the last few years, I've been invited by Arthur Nikou, the builder, to his house in Samoa. Last Christmas, my wife received a solid gold pen from Nikou with her initials on it. I was furious, wanted her to send it back, but I was told that Nikou sent dozens of such gifts to the wives of his acquaintances each Christmas, and my wife liked the pen, so like a fool, I relented. It would look nice in the press, wouldn't it? Minister's wife received gold pen gift from Nikou. Your Excellency, about Peekmal. Isn't it strange that he brought the report to you and didn't hand it over to his school director? It's as if he knew how important it was, isn't it? I think so, yes. 
Unless somebody told him to take it to you. Yes. I think I see the point you're getting at. I don't like it. No, nor do I, Your Excellency, but I'm trying to look at the situation from different angles. Now, who beside yourself has the key to this apartment? My wife, of course. Oh, she's in the country at present. My secretary, Blanche Lamotte. Has she worked for you long? Since she was 17, straight from school. Uh, she now must be 40, 42. Tell me, after Picmal handed the report to you and left, did you have it in your hand when she came back? I think I did. I think I walked around with it in my hand for some time before I put it in my case. I trust her entirely, Major. Thank you. You see, all I'm doing is to try to find my way. Now, does anybody else have the keys? Yes, my parliamentary private secretary, Jacques Fleury. And have you known him long, monsieur? He's my age, and I've known him since we were at the Lycée together. What sort of person is he? Odd. Rich parents, but he never did anything with his life. He's a typical amiable failure. But he does know the jungle of our political system as well as any man. I need that sort of knowledge. I'm a provincial lawyer become cabinet minister, Maigre. I'm not a politician in the wheeler dealer sense. And Fleury is a man I can relax with. Do he and Blanche get on well? On the surface, it's cordial enough. Deep in her heart, Blanche can't stand him, I'm sure. She's a bourgeoise through and through, and Fleury is the sort of person... Yes, the bourgeoisie can be unrelenting. So? Where have we got, Maigret? To this hypothesis, Your Excellency. Quite out of the blue, you're presented with a copy of the Kalam report, which seems genuine and which disappears immediately afterwards. Now, this seems to me to be a way of discrediting you and the government by claiming that the report was in your hands, but has been suppressed or conveniently lost. Now, all I have to do is to find the thing and the thief who took it. And I have to tell the President that it's been stolen. Late though it is, I should go there now. Thank you, Megre, you've eased my mind. I'm in your hands. My poor old friend. A cabinet minister's fate placed in your hand. I must admit, on my way home, I did wonder what had hit me. I take it that you felt you could trust Poirin. Oh, yes. He was no double-dealing politician, Georges. There was a strong affinity between us. We came from the same sort of country background. We were of the same age and size. And I had the curious sensation that if I'd had a brother, he would have been not unlike Auguste Poirin. I think he realised the affinity, too. And the people around him. Were they to be trusted? Mm. Somebody, Jules, borrowed the keys to that apartment, didn't they? Knowing the report was there and knowing that the desk could be easily opened. All very true, Georges. But I also thought some of the clues lay with the man Piquemal. I put old Luca onto him. I got Jean Vier to look into Mademoiselle Blanche and La Pointe to dig around Jacques Fleury. And once I set them on their ways, I picked up the newspapers on my desk to see if there was anything on the disaster or the report in them. There was. Mm, is it true that the Clairefond Sanatorium was not born in the minds of those concerned with the plight of children, but in the mind of a builder in concrete? Mm, tough stuff. Not paper. Ah, the globe again. Masculin's mouthpiece. Masculin, the deputy. I wonder. What else? <laughs> Fat checks to officials. Julien Calam foresaw the disaster. Is it true that the Calam report vanished? Is it true that 30 officials live in terror of the report being found? Is it true that it has been found? Hmm, they are onto something. And this. We want to know is the Calam report still in the hands of the person? To whom it was given recently, or has it been destroyed? Where is the Kalam report? <sighs> Poor Auguste Point. Where the hell has got it in for him? Joseph Masculin? Why? Come in. Oh, hello, Jean Vier, you're back quickly. <laughs> What's up? Uh, I went to Mademoiselle Lamotte's apartment building, Chief. Mm. I asked the concierge if Mademoiselle Lamotte was at home. I thought she gave me an odd look, but I went on and said I was an inspector from an insurance company. 
And then the concierge began laughing at me. Uh -huh. Well, I tried to ignore this. So she said, how many different branches of the police are there in Paris? And don't you ever tell each other what you're each up to? Security and uh, who else? As I left, well, there was no point in going on, was there, Chief? No, no point. As you left what? There was a man coming round the corner and about to cross over the road as if he were making for the entrance to the apartments. Only he suddenly swerved away. I reckon it was when he saw me. I think I know him by sight. Uh, he was from the Rue des Saussets, do you mean? I don't know. I seem to remember him in some security business. But if he was security, he wouldn't bother to stay out of my way, would he? No, if he knew you, he'd probably grin and go on with his job. What was he like? About 40, growing fat, brown face, red neck, and he was smoking a cigar. Well, the description would fit most of the Rue des Saussets inspectors, wouldn't it? <laughs> Except for the cigar. <laughs> yes, I wonder. Listen, go and speak nicely to old Chabot in records. Ask him to show you photos of those chaps who've left the security branch these last uh, couple of years. See if you can trace your man. All right, Chief. Uh, and uh, do I still try to find out anything on Blanche Lamont? You oh, better leave it alone for the moment. Uh, I don't suppose there's any point in my asking you what it's all in aid of. None at all, Jean Vier, my lad. Right, Chief. Now I'm going across the road with a glass of beer and to await what you call the point find. Who did you say you were? If you turn the music off, you won't have to lip read. I think I'm a wee bit deaf. And at my age, that's serious. <laughs> um, you are Jacqueline Page, the actress. Oh, you've made my day. Who are you, you lovely man? Um, that I'm Inspector Lapointe of the Quai des Orfèvres. And I'm making some, some inquiries, inquiries of a routine, routine nature. nature and... About Jacques Fleury. Does this happen often? That I join in the chorus that poor old Jacques is inquired into. That Monsieur Fleury is investigating. Twice yesterday, two at a time. <sighs> oh, dear. I feel rather a fool. I mean, I mean, nobody tells anybody else what's going on. I told Jacques last night, and he said they were from Rue des Saussets. So, you're different. You're from the other place. And you're younger and rather dishy, really. Come and sit down on the couch beside me. Ah. Uh... Oh, do come on. I won't bite you. <clears throat> Not at once. What did they want to know? What do you want to know, Inspector Lapointe? Well, who are the sort of people he associates with? Are they respectable, <laughs> for instance? Are you sitting on your pistol by any chance, Inspector? <laughs> I don't carry a pistol, Mademoiselle. Oh, you look so uncomfortable. Do relax. What sort of people does Jacques associate with? He associates with me, monsieur, and I'm young enough to be his daughter, and I can assure you, not at all respectable. You have friends in common, mademoiselle? Oh, yes, lots, and a jolly bad crowd they are. Film people, models, musicians, journalists, radio and television directors, all the riffraff of Paris. And, of course, Jacques has his connections on the seamier side of politics. He keeps those to himself. Is he sometimes short of money, temporarily? Oh, Charlie, he's always short of money. He does have a wife, you know, and two kids out in the suburbs somewhere. But in his job, people give him credit, give him a lot for nothing. I don't, of course. I'm expensive to run. Yes. Does he talk about his work to you? Not much. Belly aches sometimes about the hours. The last two from the security mob wanted to know if he brought documents home here and worked on them in the evenings. And what did you tell them? That we had better things to do in the evenings than look at documents. <laughs> it serves them right for asking. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not in any trouble, is he? Real trouble. He hasn't been stupid, has he? Oh, no, no, mademoiselle. To be honest with you, I don't know myself what it's all about. Can I get you a drink? You must stay for a while. I get so lonely. Oh. <laughs> so there you have it, Chief. <laughs> well, it's all we want for you to laugh, Luca. But you really was quite a handful. Lucky devil. I must say, Chief, Jacques Fleury doesn't match up with my idea of a PPS. No, young mistress, short of money, fast friends. He's bloody good material for a little corruption, Chief, I think. Yes, I wonder how much. Oh, never mind. Anything else, Lapointe? No, not really. I suppose security are keeping a watch on Jacques and Dean's place for their own reasons. Was there somebody outside? Yes, I think so. He moved off when I came out. What was he like? Forty or so. Fat but strong-looking. Fat face. Had a cigar. Whoever he is, he certainly gets around. He is security, isn't he? 
On the other hand... Why did he move off? Yeah. And he did the same thing to Jean Vier earlier this morning. No, I think he may once have been with the Rue des Saucer, but is now a sort of freelance. He matches up with the description given me of the chap who went off with Peekmal an hour ago. Mm, uh, tell me from the beginning, Luca. You got into Peekmal's room, I gather. Well, it wasn't difficult. I took a room at the hotel, and with a little manipulation, my room key opened Peekmal's room. Well, it'd probably have opened any room. Now drink your beer and shut up, Le oh. Go on, Luca. A bachelor den of a certain sort. One extra suit, one old toothbrush... A comb mm. with half his teeth missing, a few old shirts. He doesn't bother about his appearance, for sure. A lot of books, and there was a cardboard box in one of the drawers full of membership cards. Mm. I don't think there was any party or society he hadn't belonged to at one time. The Cross of Fire, Action Francaise, Communist Party, International Theosophy League. See what I mean? Mm. Oh, yes, and, and some books on yoga, one of which I picked up and shook. I don't know why. Yes, it's a sort of instinct. I've done it myself. I want. Sorry, Chief. But this fell out of it, Chief. Oh, thank you. Chamber of Deputies, dear sir, thank you for your note. I'm greatly interested in what you tell me, and we'll be glad to see you tomorrow around 8 p.m. at the Brasserie du Croissant au Montmartre. I beg you not to mention the matter in question to anybody until then. Address to H. Pitmal and dated. Last Thursday, that's five days ago, signed. Yes, hard to tell. But I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't Joseph Mascola. Thank you, Luca. But later, I rang the engineering school and asked where I could find Monsieur Piquemal at lunchtime. I said it was a friend. They told me he always went to a cafe, but they gave me lousy directions. I got there late. I couldn't see anybody who looked like your description of him, so I asked the lady at the desk who told me he just left with a man. She'd noticed because in all the years Pete might have been coming to the cafe for lunch, this is the only time she could remember him not leaving alone. And the man was fat, 40, round faced? I'm afraid she thought he looked like a copper, only he smoked a cigar. Uh. Evidently, he came in after Pete Mal, went up to him, and after a short conversation, they left together. Hmm. Luca, you have the number of the school. Ring and ask to speak to Pete Mal. If he's there, put the receiver down. Yes, Chief. But mm. you don't think he will be. Oh. This is important, isn't it, Chief? Mm, in a way it is. For one man it is, and it isn't murder. And if we don't succeed, the government could fall. I see. Government could fall? Is that all? <laughs> hell's bells. As you say, hell's bells. A cabinet minister is being set up as a scapegoat. It's quite a cunning plan with all sorts of advantages for the person setting it up. Yeah. Jack Fleury is part of the plan, I'm sure. Sooner or later, we'll have to take him in and ask him some questions. Yes, Luca? Hasn't been seen since he went to lunch. Mm. They can't imagine what's happened to him. It's the first time in 20 years that our Monsieur Piquemal has not turned up for his lecture, and without a word of explanation. They wonder if he's had an accident. No, I don't think it was an accident. Piquemal is operating under his own steam, but with help. And while I'm on the subject, Luca, there's a Madame Calame, the widow of one Julien Calame, living at 77 Boulevard Raspail. Now go and have a word with her. Ask her if Pete Mal called to see her recently and if he wanted to see her late husband's papers. Madame Calame? Mm. So, this is the missing Calame report we're looking for, is it? The Calame report? The Clairefond disaster business? You've guessed it. But I didn't tell you. La Pointe. I want you to go to the Boulevard Pasteur, where our minister has an apartment. Question the tenants on his floor, will you? Yes. Maybe somebody saw a man going into number 27 on Tuesday morning and can give us a description. Yes, Chief. Yes, a poor wretched minister is waiting to see me, besieged by the press and with the president breathing down his neck. What's he like, Chief, this minister? Hmm? Well, he's rather like me. Only I'm not in politics. Chief Inspector, so you're in on it, are you? In on what? That's what we'd like to know. Ah, Chief Inspector Magret, I'm Jack Fleury. The minister is waiting to see you. Now you've told them that you're Fleury. Oh, so you are in on it, Magret. Yeah, Chief Inspector. Come on, get me out of here. I think why we don't kick them out. I mean, come on, give us a break. Chief Inspector Magret, Your Excellency. Do you want me to stay? No, Jack. 
Come and sit down, Megui. Oh, thank you. I'll be in the other office then, where there are no reporters. Well, Megui, as you can see, the hounds are baying, eh? and the President won't accept my resignation. Uh, we found this letter in Pete Mull's hotel room. Thank you. So, Peak Mal got in touch with Masculine, did he? So it seems, Your Excellency. And Peak Mal has, I suspect, gone into hiding with somebody looking after him. Hiding from what? Oh, from my chaps and myself. We'd like a talk with him, you know. I'm sure you would. I find myself surprisingly calm, Megri. I'm likely to be run out of political life in the next 48 hours, disgraced and so on. And somehow I don't care. Well, in 48 hours, I should be able to discover who stole the report. It's your job to hold out until then, Your Excellency. I will, Megui, I will. 48 hours, eh? So Masculin has been behind this from the beginning. Yes, Masculin, the professional crusader. The obvious person for a nutcase, if you'll excuse the expression, to turn to. Peak Mal would never trust authority. One can't blame him, not entirely. And Masculin sent him to me with the report. He did. I'm sure he took a photocopy of the thing first. Then he'll probably challenge the government quite soon. Well, unless he prefers to profit from what he knows to increase his influence, Your Excellency. I thought you knew little of politics. Well, I'm learning. I've discovered how important the masculines of this world are. Now, I'd say he has a passion for power, and he's used his reputation as a merciless crusader for truth and justice as a base for his power. That's quite true. He... Set me up, as you say, didn't he? Mm. I have the feeling that there's a personal element in this. Is there? I once snubbed him in public a long time ago, but it's not the kind of thing he'd forget or forgive. You think he took a photocopy? Yes, he would. The masculines of my world live by the photocopy and the tape recording, which means even if we find the stolen carbon, masculine will still have the material. Mm. If I can get the report back, that won't matter, Your Excellency. You'll be in the clear. And the government will have to publish, or...? Well, surely it should be published, Your Excellency. If I were allowed the decision, Megre, but I'm not. Mm. No, thank you for giving me your time. Thank you, Megre. Do your best. Hold out for 48 hours. I can't promise you to find the report, but... I'll be damned if I don't put my hand on the person who got into your apartment and stole it. <laughs> that, at least, is my profession. Fine words, Jules. Could you do it? I was pretty sure, you know, Georges. So they weren't empty words. And you had the Maigre team rushing around in all directions. No, in proper directions, please, Georges, and to a purpose. First, Jean Vier came up with a name and a picture of our gentleman with the cigar. He was one Benoit. Do you recall him? Benoit. But of course. He had to leave security after a very unsavory business that was also political. Girls and secrets, wasn't it, in some way? Yes, it was, and Benoit was lucky not to be behind bars for a few years. Now he was out of the police and working as a private dick. He was seen going into Auguste Poin's apartment, by the way, on the morning in question. La Pointe found an eyewitness... <laughs> the ladies like La Pointe. And this lady, who lived on the same floor as the minister, wouldn't, I'm sure, have remembered nearly so well without La Pointe's gentle attentions. And we showed her a picture of Benoit. She was sure it was the one. And Luca was visiting Madame Calam, wasn't he? He was. That's where Picmal found his copy of the report, all right. You mean, while the whole government machine was looking for the thing, it was with Madame Calam, or a copy was? How obvious. Mm, it was, wasn't it? Among the late professor's papers. The Peak Miles studied under him at one time, and he presented himself at the widow's apartment and asked to look for some old study papers. She let him help himself. So a lot of things were tied up. All you had to do was find Benoit and Peak Miles. Now, Jean Vier was pretty sure he knew where they were. Somebody had tipped him the wink. Before we picked him up, I had to meet Joseph Masculin just for the sake of it. I knew he lunched each day at a particular restaurant, so I decided to do the same. May I join you, Chief Inspector? Ah, yes, monsieur. You know who I am, I'm sure? I do, Monsieur Masculin. 
I was going to phone you today, but seeing you here... Well, I came here hoping to have a word with you. I saw in the press this morning that you're working on the missing Kalam report. Yeah, the stolen Kalam report. You know it's been stolen, do you? I know that the carbon copy Peak Mal obtained from Madame Kalam has been stolen. I believe I know how and by who. Peak Mal wrote to me. Mm, I know he did. Presumably he brought the copy to you. He left it in my office with my secretary. I didn't touch it, Chief Inspector. I don't play with dynamite. I told him to take it to the Ministry concerned. And did you think he would? With his salt, there's no knowing. With his sort, it's necessary to watch what they do, yes, monsieur? If you mean what I think you mean, Chief Inspector, then I think you're being rather foolish. Mm. I'm not the man to make an enemy of. Yes, so I've been told. I find it strange, Monsieur Mescalin, that knowing the importance of Pigmal's find, you didn't contact the Minister yourself at once. The trouble it would have saved. I'm a busy man, Chief Inspector. I haven't the time to deal personally with many things brought to me by the public. And yet you knew this was political dynamite? And there wasn't another copy of it to be found anywhere because the other copies had probably been destroyed to save a lot of necks? Really, monsieur, you surprise me. If you choose not to believe me, Maigret, that is your privilege. <laughs> if you choose to believe I'm a fool and swallow any old cock and bull story because it comes from a man of some importance, that is your privilege. I don't think this little talk is going to do you any good, Negri. No, it's ruined a good meal. All right, jean Vier, my boy. Where are you taking me? Seine Port, Chief. It's about five kilometers. A small village on the bank of the Seine, if my memory serves me right. Mm. Good for fishing. Rod fishing, Chief. Uh, rod fishing, Jean-Pierre. Uh, Eugène Benoit is a great angler. He has a hut just outside the village, near the floodgate. A water bailiff's hut. He spends quite a few weekends in it. He left for it yesterday with a chap answering to Peak Mal's description. Good. I should have thought the Masculin, or whoever else it is employing Benoit, might have found a more comfortable place to hide out in. Somewhere in Paris, Chief. We'd never have found them. Oh, true. Now, I don't think their employer wants to get too near the action. Probably told Benoit to arrange it himself, which he did in his own simple way. Mm. Oh, we're coming near the village, aren't we? Yeah, we are. It'll be dark by the time we make the hut, if I can find it. That must be it, Chief. Yeah. There's a light in the window. It's a decent size, Dad, I must say. Oh, there's the path. I'll pull in here. to be curtains to that window. Come on, then. Right, Chief. Uh, do you think he'll give trouble? Well, I hope not. He was a tough character, I seem to remember, but I'm not up to a brawl these days. <laughs> Quiet. Ah, there's a bench beneath the window. Yeah, get on it and have a look. Right. Carefully. Oh, what a god for sake, no. Both there. Hmm? Peak Mal seems to be reading some thick document. Benoit's playing patience. Is there much of a fire? Fire? There's a stove. Well, keep between it and Peak Mal. I'm sure it's the Kalam report he's reading. Let's go. Wait for it. Who are you? I'll give you two guesses, Benoit. Megre. I thought it might be. Monsieur Pickmal, may I have the report, please? It's mine. It's mine. <laughs> no, you look no, no, come on now, give no. it to me. We don't want it but don't do it. Come on now. Oh, give it to him, Pickmal. Uh, Stop uh, being such a bloody uh, fool. Oh, oh, here you are. Your bosses will burn it. There'll be no justice. You wait and see. It won't matter to you, Pickmal, if it's burned. Joseph Mascalin took a copy of it, and that he won't burn, I'm sure. Oh. 
Remember when I go up for sentence, May Gray? I helped to save the report I pinched. Mm, I suppose our engineering supervisor came of his own free will, did he? He begged to come. He was rather scared. What of? I'm not quite sure. Well, so would you be if you found yourself the instrument of a justice that hundreds are trying to avoid? Mm, he goes on like that all the time. I keep trying to get it into his head that he's only got himself mixed up in some typical political chicanery. Oh, I suppose Mescalin employs you to do his dirty work. <laughs> I've never even heard of the man. And one day, Mascalin will get his comeuppance, but not this time. Who gave you the keys to the minister's apartment? Why ask me when you know? Uh, you had the Richard man in your pocket. Money or sex? Which? The sum of both is enough to ruin him. Now he's going to be ruined anyway. Still, he was useful at the time. Did you know, Benoit, that we were on your tail? I nearly knocked into you in the street, didn't I? When I was trying to discover what Mademoiselle Lamotte knew. Knew about what? Whether or not Poin was going to acknowledge that the report had been nicked. Some politicians would have said it was mislaid and sworn in their mother's grave that it would come to light. But not Auguste Poin. All right, dampen down the fire, Jean Vier. Let's get back to Paris. And give me that report. Have you arrested me too? Well, have you? No, Monsieur Pigmel. I have released you. Come and sit down, Maigret. Thank you, Your Excellency. Look, 48 hours is almost up. I know. I've come to return the Kalam report to you. You found the copy that was stolen from my apartment? Yes, but I'm afraid... Where's the report now? You have it with you? Well, I left it with Monsieur Fleury on my way in. Let's have Fleury in then with the thing. No, before you have him in, may I tell you what I must about Fleury? Huh? It's unpleasant. Oh. Go on. Well, I'm afraid I shall have to take him to the quay and charge him. I felt that you should know first. I think you had some idea. I knew somebody who had access to my apartment must have been involved in the theft. Did Jacques do it? No, Your Excellency. An ex-security man called Benoit actually did the job with Fleury's keys. Benoit is, I'm sure, employed by Masculin to do his dirty tricks, only he won't admit it and never will. We couldn't make it stick if he did. Maigre, you've left Fleury out there with the rip. I'm not alone, monsieur. Inspector Luca is with it. Ah, uh, of course. You're charging Benoit? I have already. He'll plead guilty to housebreaking. The purpose of the housebreaking will not have to be defined in court. He'll get a couple of years. No doubt he's been paid well for it. Wasn't he meant to destroy the report? Surely he was. Mm, by what he doesn't say, yes, I think he was. I think he's getting a bit of his own back on Masculine, to put it in the simplest terms. And, of course, Peekmal wanted to read it again. Peekmal was with this man, Benoit. Well, Peekmal had gone into hiding as an instrument of justice. He felt insecure. An instrument of justice, Peekmal. Mm. And Masculine wanted him out of the way. He's now free, with nothing to charge him with. Thank God. You'd love to be a martyr. Let's get it over and done with. Mm. Do come in, Jacques, and bring the report. So much of this is my fault. Your Excellency. Why did you have to do it, Jacques? Your Excellency. We picked up your friend Benoit last night. He still had the report. I shall have to take you from here and charge you with conspiring to cause a crime to be committed. Is that all, Chief Inspector? Not betrayal of my appointment and my old friend. You should. I deserve more than just a criminal charge. Why did you have to betray, Jacques? There may be some security charge, Fleury. That's not up to me. But I can't charge you with moral turpitude, thank the Lord. I'm sorry, Auguste. Benoit had me in his pocket. I swear to you, I didn't know what he was after. And it would have made no difference. You'd still have given him the keys, wouldn't you? Yes, I had no choice. Or rather, I wouldn't make the choice. What a ghastly mess I've made of my life. Do take me away, Chief Inspector. If I stay here any longer, I'll burst into tears. Luca, is all yours. Right, Chief. Let's leave the building as if we're just going out for a beer, eh? I should have dismissed him months ago. I'd been told various things. I knew he couldn't be trusted. I could have saved him. He could have saved himself, too. In a few months, when all this is forgotten, I'll hand in my resignation, Megley. 
go back to my sleepy provincial town and practice law again. I think you'll be happier, monsieur. Thank you, Maker. Thank you for everything. Well, I was only doing my job. The essential thing is, Your Excellency, the report is back with you. You cannot be made the scapegoat. No. Thank God. And muscular? One day. Yeah. Mm. One day he'll get what's coming to him, I'm sure. Yes. I'm not very good at expressing myself in some ways, maybe. Only <laughs> do keep in touch. When I resign, come and stay with us. There aren't many people I've found to like in Paris. Nor I, Your Excellency. But now and again, luckily, one adds to the number. Well, Jules, so you wrapped it up. Or did you? Well, I only wrapped up the immediacies, Georges. The rest was a long story. Some of which I know nothing of, and none of which was a police matter, I'm glad to say. I seem to remember something connected with Joseph Masculin. Didn't he find himself in court? What was it? Well, I can't recall in detail, but he took on more than he could chew, and the rich and the important turned and smote him. That was it. The Lyon industrial people. He was made to look a fool and fine. Mm, so there was only a slow eclipse for him, no martyrdom. And the others? The Picmal moved off somewhere. He probably imagined he was some sort of prime target. Fleury killed himself, finally. Benoit is to be seen doing his shady work in dark corners still. He got two years. He was out in one. Auguste Poin, I visit from time to time in his pleasant house in a sleepy town. They didn't publish the report, did they? No. So he had a chance to resign on a principle. And the report has been forgotten, eclipsed by other scandals. Such is our political life. Which Poin is happily out of and should never have been in. He was too nice a man, Jules, and he didn't want to hurt his old friend. And he didn't understand that he could be used. He had honor, well, there's precious little honor. A nice man, and a good friend.